Welcome back everyone to another installment of Space This Week. Every Monday I recap all the launches we saw during the past week, all the biggest Starship developments we saw, and all the other cool stories that I think are worthy of mention. Today, as usual, we have a bunch of stuff to cover. We have some amazing new footage from Mars, welcome Jebediah Kerman back to Earth, and a whole host of Starship stuff and much, much more. Let's kick things off. We'll start the coverage as we usually do with Starship news. Ship 24 lives! This latest and greatest Starship is expected to be the first Starship to perform an orbital flight test, launching atop Booster 7. Here's a cute shot of the future couple, Ship 24 in the high bay and Booster 7 in the mega bay. Shortly after this picture was taken, Ship 24 was rolled out of the high bay after having its aft flaps installed and heat shielding mostly finished, and SpaceX rolled it down to the launch site. The launch area has felt a little bit empty ever since the removal of Ship 20, so it's good to see a Starship out there again. I for one feel that the piping and cable raceway on the side of the ship look far neater than on Ship 20, and it goes without saying that SpaceX's tiling job gets better and better with each Starship iteration as well. In this side-by-side -side of Ship 24 and Ship 20, Ship 20 on the left, Ship 24 on the right, you can see that Ship 24 has the newer style of nose cone, made of fewer panels. Now SpaceX wasted no time in putting Ship 24 through its paces. After basically no time at all, we saw venting from the side of the vehicle, indicating clear signs of life. Hopefully the test itself was successful, but unfortunately there were some snags during a Ship 24 pressurization test. Much like with Ship 20, the issue of heat shield tiles falling off appeared to rear its ugly head once more. A significant number of heat shield tiles flew off the side of the vehicle. Look at the aftermath shot here. Hopefully these mass tile pop-offs are just a symptom of Ship 24 being pressurized for the first time, so any small dents and imperfections in the stainless steel will get popped out during this. If that is the case, then I would hope that future tests won't see quite as many tiles flying off the ship, or of course, hopefully no tiles at all. Another issue with the cryo test was that some of the ship's piping appears to have been damaged. Look at this clip from Starship Gazer, showing crews removing a very bent section of pipe. Hopefully any issues with the ship can be identified and fixed by SpaceX. If they can fix things, then hopefully we'll start seeing things like static fires taking place in the very near future, and of course, hopefully, an eventual launch. We might even get some testing of the Starlink V2 Pez dispenser. Ship 24 has a really thin slit cargo bay door that dispenses the Starlink satellites in a similar fashion to an industrial pallet sacker, or in the more fun example, a giant steel Pez dispenser. It's interesting that Ship 24 was rolled out without all of its heat shield tiles installed. I and many others believe that the reason for this is so it's easier to diagnose any problems during inspections and during tests, since the seams between the segments are exposed around the entire circumference of the ship, so there's no risk of any tiles occluding something. Thing. I could be wrong though, if you've got any alternate theory then I'd love to hear it in the comment section down below. And hey, while you're down there, remember to drop a little like on the video if you're enjoying the ride so far, and subscribe so that you don't miss any space news, I always do appreciate the support. A few weeks ago, we talked about how SpaceX were making some changes to the quick disconnect arm that connects to the Starship, and now they're working on the quick disconnect arm for the booster. This connection supplies the first stage with power and propellant prior to liftoff, and here in this time-lapse shot, we can see crews lifting the new protective covering for the mechanism. This was captured by Ezekiel Overstreet, he's fairly new to the Starbase photography scene, and he's already putting out some great stuff, like this photo of a newly delivered thrust puck holder, which is used for storing the thrust pucks of the Super Heavy first stage, or in other words, the metal dish that the engines attach to. And he also caught some photos of a new methane transfer tube being delivered to the build site. He also took this photo of workers in installing a fence at the launch site. It looks like the great view that we usually get into the launch site isn't going to be quite as unobstructed in the near future, as it looks like SpaceX are beginning the construction of a fence at this location. This is almost certainly a security requirement from the government, and these vehicles do have extremely high military value, so it's understandable that SpaceX would want to protect themselves here. I guess it is just ultimately quite difficult to keep things secure and anonymous when you're a 120 meter tall stainless steel rocket, but if you're just a simple internet user, then things are actually a lot more simple. You could just use Private Internet Access, who have coincidentally sponsored today's video. Private Internet Access is a VPN provider with over 10 years of expertise, over 30 million downloads, and they're the world's most transparent VPN provider. 
All of their software is 100% open source. Private Internet Access is a VPN which lets you change your IP address and reroute your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel, allowing you to gain unrestricted access to geo-locked content with all the major streaming services such as Netflix, and Private Internet Access is one of the few VPNs that fully supports peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and torrenting. They use world-class infrastructure across more than 83 countries, guaranteeing you a secure, reliable VPN connection anytime, anywhere. And one subscription can be used to protect up to 10 devices at a time, and it'll work for all the major platforms. Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, iOS, and much, much more. And right now you can grab an 82% discount on private internet access, which works out to just $2.11 per month by using my link, privateinternetaccess.com slash mattlown. And on top of all that, you also get three extra months completely free. So go on, what are you waiting for? Unlock the power of your internet connection today. Now, when it's not fences that SpaceX are building, it's future Starship variants, such as with Ship 25. And we can see that here, Ship 25 is quickly taking shape. Its forward dome section was sleeved on Wednesday. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, released part two of his Starbase tour with Elon Musk. We saw some great views directly underneath the giant catch arms, which of course will be catching the massive super heavy booster, which Elon reminded us was nine meters in diameter and weighing in at 250 tons, though SpaceX do hope to make this lighter over time. Elon also mentioned that SpaceX have produced the first Starlink V2 satellite, confirming that it's seven meters long and weighs 1.25 tons, so neither Falcon 9 nor Heavy have the ability to place these into orbit. Only Starship can, which is a big motivator for SpaceX to get this vehicle into orbit. Starlink V2 will be almost an order of magnitude better than Starlink 1, and the satellites are much more capable. After the time spent beneath the arms, we then got the unique experience of ascending the launch tower itself, inside the rather cosy elevator. The views at the top were amazing, humans on the ground, and even the Starship vehicles themselves looked tiny. Elon also talked about how the prospect of enabling life on Mars is not the only way in which Starship can ensure the survival of humanity. Having a rocket with Starship's capability would represent a system that could protect the Earth from asteroids and comets, that could potentially impact Earth and end all life as we know it. A capability that we really don't have right now. If you haven't seen Tim's video by now, then I would highly recommend doing so. What I've just mentioned now is only really a snippet, so definitely click the card on screen or the link in the description to watch the full thing. Starship Gazer caught this shot of a Pathfinder battery unit covered in stickers denoting that it has a bad BMS, which stands for Battery Management System. These batteries attach to the booster's aft section. Here's another picture from Starship Gazer showing their mounting position. In this shot, Booster 7 is on the launch pad because this is a fairly old photo. At present, it's in the mega bay while crews work on stage zero. Starship Gazer caught this clip of SpaceX testing the new Starship Quick Disconnect arm. This is the first time we've seen them test its movement like this, ever since it was replaced to fit the updated panel design on the newer Starship variants. Last week, on Wednesday, SpaceX launched their fifth Falcon 9 dedicated small satellite rideshare mission. These missions involve SpaceX basically cramming a whole bunch of small satellites into the massive Falcon 9 fairing. In the case of last week's launch, there were 59 payloads packed inside, from a whole host of customers around the globe. The main benefit to the customers here is a potentially very low launch cost, given that it's spread across so many people, so it could be as low as 1 million US dollars, which in orbital launch terms is very cheap. <laughs> this was the eighth flight for this particular Falcon 9 booster, B1061, which took to the skies last week after just a 54-day turnaround. One of the nice things about the transport emissions is that the Falcon 9 first stage detaches from the second stage with enough fuel left to perform a boost back burn that takes it all the way back to the mainland. And on this occasion, the booster gracefully touched down in landing zone one at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. I love the landing zone touchdowns just because of the great third person camera angles. They really just hit different to the drone ship landings. One of the more interesting payloads on this mission was the NanoRax Outpost Technology Demonstration Mission called Outpost Mars Demo 1. This satellite will cut metal samples that represent spent upper stages. In fact, the metal samples here are the same kind of stainless steel used on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket. The goal here is to test technologies for converting spent rocket stages into NanoRax space outposts, which is the long-term objective for the company. NanoRacks can't really just use a hacksaw to perform the cuts, since really the metal needs to be cut without excess debris. It wouldn't be good to send shards of metal flying all over the place after all. This mission will therefore use friction milling, which will involve a cutting wheel that heats the metal to extremely high temperatures, causing it to melt. 
Another payload I really like is the SelfieSat. This is a Norwegian satellite built entirely from off-the-shelf parts, and uses a Raspberry Pi for its main computer. When deployed, the satellite will extend a selfie stick, i.e. a Raspberry Pi camera on the end of a bit of metal, which points back at the satellite, hence the name SelfieSat. That's not all though, on the camera facing portion of the satellite, there'll be a small LCD screen, which will display pictures of students from schools from around Norway, meaning that they'll be able to have selfies of themselves taken in space. This will actually serve quite a good scientific mission though, one of the major components component here is, of course, the LCD screen. So far, we've never placed an LCD screen in the vacuum of space in unfiltered sunlight, so it'll be interesting to see if it holds up. Another interesting story from last week was the departure of Boeing Starliner, and of course Jebediah Kerman, from the International Space Station. The capsule autonomously undocked from the Harmony module's forward-facing docking adapter on Wednesday evening. It then proceeded to deorbit itself, carrying just over 250 kilograms of cargo. After passing through the re-entry phase, the capsule successfully landed at the White Sands Space Harbor, located in the United States Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Although we couldn't really see if Jebediah was definitely okay in the live stream shots, here's hoping he survived. I mean, I've definitely subjected Jeb to G-forces that should have definitely caused him to turn to mush, so I reckon he's probably fine. <laughs> now, check out this amazing footage filmed by the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. This is the onboard camera view of the helicopter's 25th flight, which took place in early April. This flight was its longest and fastest flight to date, covering a distance of 704 meters, or 2,310 feet, at a speed of 5 Five and a half meters per second, or 12 miles an hour. Ingenuity there, continuing to surpass all expectations, hopefully NASA can keep on pushing the boundaries with this mission. I would now like to thank my patrons and channel members, whose generous support of my channel allows me to continue making this content for you all. If you want to join the magnificent list of names on screen, you can click the join button below the video, or via the Patreon link in the description or on screen. Otherwise, there are two video suggestions from my channel there, check them out if they look interesting. Thank you all so much for watching once again, and I'll see you all next time.